Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Popcotter, and you're listening to Call Talk for October 31st. And today's topic is hidden obstacles to outstanding customer service. If you're listening live, we invite you to be part of the show and ask questions. Here's how you do it. Email me at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com. I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to any time of the day at benchmarkportal.com. And now with that, I'd like to introduce the host of the show, Bruce Belfiore. Well, thank you, Alan, and happy Halloween, everyone. Today's episode of Call Talk will be dedicated to debunking some of the treats and the tricks we use to try to improve CSR service. You know, so many managers spend endless time, money, and emotional energy trying to get agents to improve their customers' experiences. And, you know, on this, uh, they try rewards, games, wall boards, all kinds of other tricks to try to get the best possible out of their, uh, their agents so that they give a really good experience to their customers. So to talk about this in more detail, we brought back an expert on the topic for you, Jeff Toyster, author of Getting Service Right, Welcome back to the show, Jeff. Hey, Bruce, thanks for having me again. And, you know, I'm a little embarrassed because I'm a repeat guest, and I forgot that this is audio only. So I am wearing an amazing Halloween costume, and and you can't see it. (laughs) But thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. That's great. Can you describe it to us, Jeff? I am Swag Man. I, I, I just returned from a contact center conference. Uh, in Chicago, where every vendor's got something to give to you. So I've got a cape, a T-shirt, socks, a hat, sunglasses, you name it. I have vendor (laughs) swag all over. There you go. That's great. That's great. I love that swag, too. Bring it home, and I wear it. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, some of my favorite shirts, in fact, come from shows. That's it. So, yeah, in fact, you and I saw each other at the Austin Contact Center Alliance last month, uh, where you gave an absolutely fabulous keynote. Uh, that was uh, great for anybody on the call who who was there. They'll they'll, they'll confirm that. And for those of you on the call who don't know Jeff, he's a veteran of Call Talk, as we said, and he's also the best-selling author author who's written three customer service books, including Getting Service Right, Overcoming the Hidden Obstacles to Outstanding Customer Service. And that's what we're going to be concentrating on today. Uh, Jeff has been recognized as a top customer service thought leader by Global Gurus, ICMI, and Com 100, and thousands of customer service professionals from around the world subscribe to Jeff's customer service tip of the week email. And thousands have taken his video-based courses on LinkedIn learning. So, Jeff, let's... uh, uh, get down into things. One of the things actually I love about what you do is that you oftentimes take the contrarian point of view on some accepted best practices. And this is a great way to open up discussion, which is always a good way to find the road toward better practices. And uh, so we'll be doing uh, a lot of that, I think, on the call today. So, you, sp- you know, just to take a step back, though, you've spent a lot of time investigating how to help contact center agents be their best. Uh, Just let our audience know how you first got started doing this. Well, my real passion for helping agents in a contact center be their best probably started over 20 years ago where I was running uh, the training department for two contact centers and supporting three more. And at the time, I had experience as an adult learning professional, but not a lot of experience in contact centers. What I did have, though, was a lot of data, and that uh, allowed me with so many agents. I think we we had about 600 agents in the two that I supported directly, uh, maybe a thousand or two more, you know, if in the other contact centers. And so everything we did generated data, and that allowed me to run a lot of different experiments. And those experiments often yielded some surprising results. So 
as an example, uh, the way we train new hires, we were under pressure to train faster and train better. And I figured out that uh, we weren't really training new hires uh, to do their jobs. We were training them to do little bits and pieces of their jobs. So we, we fixed new hire training, and we could immediately see the data that told us we were doing better. Or handle time, for example. That was really big in our contact center. Yet uh, I ran an experiment where we stopped having agents focus on handle time, and two things happened in the experiment. One, their uh, sales, because part of our team was inbound sales, their sales went up. And this was the funny part, or the interesting part to me, handle time stayed the same when we stopped getting agents to focus on handle time. So the, the ability to run a lot of different experiments and get data to see what actually worked and what didn't work uh, was uh, an amazing experience for me. Yeah, no, that, that's great. When you can do that sort of testing, sometimes it's uh, sequential uh, attempts, sometimes it's A-B testing that you can actually do showing different uh, units in the same call center if you're big enough to do that. Uh, you can really get some juicy, juicy data from that and uh, then actually improve the overall operation. So that's great. Well, you know, contact centers spend a lot of time and energy, obviously, on motivating agents. But you say agent motivation isn't the real problem. Why is that? The real problem, Bruce, is, is demotivation. And, and I'll, there's a lot of research on this. Uh, but I'll point to a couple of things that, that tell us why. First is I think we can all think about our first day on the job. And if we've hired well, uh, our agents are probably feeling like we did it on our first day, which is optimistic. Uh, I'm looking forward to this, uh, maybe a bit nervous. But no one shows up on the first day of the job with an intention to be mediocre or do a terrible job or really make customers angry. We walk in the door thinking things are going to be good. So that's motivation. We bring the motivation to us. But something happens along the way. And there's a, a study that, that you did uh, a number of years ago, your Agent Voices report, that uh, one of the questions that, that, I, that really stuck with me was you looked at agent job satisfaction by tenure. And when people were in their first three months, people were pretty happy with their jobs. But after three months, it took a cliff dive. And that happens to coincide with with most contact centers, training and nesting wraps up by about 12 weeks. And, and so what actually happens, and I've talked to thousands of agents who, who will tell me some version of this story, is I, I'm optimistic. I think it's going to be good. Maybe training tells me I can do a great job. And then once I start actually taking calls or answering emails, responding to chats, I realize how hard it is to make customers happy. I don't have the right tools the process that I have to follow, the metrics that are put in front of me, all make it difficult. And what happens is agents actually get discouraged over time. And so that's why I say the, the real issue is not motivation, it's demotivation. And so rather than games and contests, what uh, customer-focused contact center leaders do is they work closely with their agents to identify what are those obstacles that get in the way and how do we – either navigate around those obstacles or remove them. And when you do that, you can restore your agent's natural motivation. If you hire well, your agents want to help. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a great, great points and uh, so true. And, you know, one of the things that I think uh, members of our listening audience may be saying is, okay, well, how do I contribute to that? And obviously, there's some easy ones, which are difficult to do sometimes, which is to hire the right way to make sure that you're getting the right people in and to see if your screening is, in fact, uh, bringing people who are destined for success into the center instead of people who are destined for failure. And then there's also the fact that just your presence as a manager can make a big difference. Um, I've seen situations where we have uh, encouraged managers to be more present right from the first day uh, because in many cases they are, but in many cases uh, senior managers don't uh, show up for the first day of training, for the first day of induction of uh, the agents. And if they're there, if they're pumped up, if, they, if you as a manager really are setting the tone and feeding off of the enthusiasm that you were just saying that people naturally bring with them to the call center, that can make a huge difference because then they'll feel that they're in a, 
uh, sort of an emotional friendly <laughs> place that's that's uh, going to keep them up instead of uh, drag them down and demotivate them. So I think that's a great a great point. Um, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Because there is one other thing that I've been thinking about uh, for a couple of years and haven't been able to do anything about. But <laughs> well, to your to your point, Bruce, I, I think the um, a, a, it does start with a good leader, and unfortunately, a lot of contact centers, the supervisor, uh, their span of control is often so large that they don't have, and they have so many other administrative responsibilities, they don't really feel as though they have enough time to spend with individual agents and talking to them. But there are some easy solutions, and I'll give you an example. I, I toured the, the UPS contact center in Las Vegas, Nevada, about a year ago, and, and one of the things that they did, which was really straightforward in terms of getting agents to kind of understand what's going on and getting them involved, they had a daily huddle. But it was so well choreographed, it took less than 10 minutes. There was a daily huddle board, a whiteboard, mm -hmm. and it had a specific format. And part of the format was, hey, agents, this is what's going on today. These are our big challenges, our top priorities. And it also included a very brief discussion with agents. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What challenges are you facing? And right then and there, they would try to solve that. And all of that took less than 10 minutes just gathering the team together. So there are simple things that, that leaders can do, even if they're busy, to kind of get agents involved in identifying and solving problems. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, on the uh, huddle board concept, by the way, I did a call talk episode with Debbie Frazier. So anybody who is interested in learning more about how these huddle boards can work, Please do look that up. Go to our archive and uh, take a look at the one that I did a couple of years ago with Debbie Frazier, uh, probably in 2017 or 2018. Alan, you might remember. And uh, we went into quite a bit of detail on how these huddle boards can be really effective in doing exactly what you're talking about, Jeff. Um, the, the other thing that I've been thinking about and uh, would love for somebody in the uh, listening audience to raise their hand and say, okay, Bruce, we can do this research for you. Um, and that is, I've always wanted to chart, in other words, that phenomenon that you were talking about that we actually documented and had the stats for in um, Agent Voices. It would be really interesting to take a small group uh, in a large center, for instance, and have them have, have that small group uh, on a regular basis, maybe three times a week, maybe even four or five times a week, uh, answer a short survey that asks them how they're feeling and how they're doing. And start that when they, the first day they come in or even the day before they come in. And then, um, you know, have that survey take them through the period until they're at competence, say six months in. And see what we learned from that. Because we did another uh, call talk episode with Professor Teresa Amabile of Harvard Business School, who used this, uh, this technique to study uh, engineers and how they felt about their work. And she came up with some really interesting things that nobody thought about. You know, again, counterintuitive, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, we would be happy to, to set up the technology and actually do this with somebody to see how much we could learn about it. Uh, do you think that would have any value, Jeff? Uh, it would. I would love to see that data as well. There, you know, it it ties into something that I've done uh, in the contact center, and, and but I think it takes to the next level. So when I've run training in a contact center, one thing that I think is important is to track each learner in terms of their progress. And so it's just the mm -hmm. best practice that you have a training log, and each day. The log will say, you know, if it's one person or maybe you have a class with up to 10 agents, it doesn't matter. Here's what we covered. And then for each individual, uh, here's what they are able to do. So, in other words, uh, were, were they able to demonstrate competency with whatever the lesson of the day was, yes or no? Uh, did they have questions or concerns about anything particular? Uh, is there an area where they appear to be struggling? And this seems like a lot of information, but it's really just a moment or two for each person that you're training. And what that does is uh, it allows the trainer to pinpoint, oh, this person's really struggling. Rather than to continue on the same path, I might need to give them some extra feedback or some coaching or even just sit 
down and, and pull them aside and say, is this what you thought it was going to be? How do you feel? Mm-hmm. And, and it, was a, it was a prompt for trainers to have that one-on-one conversation. And often we could kind of course correct very quickly where if you don't do that, someone might be two weeks into it and, and inc- every day it gets worse versus, you know, there could have been a fix two weeks ago. Right, right. It's always best to understand this uh, as quickly as possible. Well, good. If there is anybody who would like to uh, pick up on, on that thought and uh, do a, a sort of a structured uh, uh, research, love to talk to you. We could do it. It can be done anonymously. Obviously, that can't be useful for coaching purposes. If it's done where the person is actually identified, then it can actually be used for coaching purposes, which makes it even more useful. So, uh, Jeff, why do you suggest that contact centers avoid sharing cue information on wall boards? This is an interesting one. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm so glad that you, you brought that one up. Uh, I will say that the contact centers generally are – slowly moving away from putting handle time metrics in front of agents. In other words, holding agents accountable for for talk time. But there's still quite a few that do that. So generally what happens when we hold agents accountable for talk time is they feel they have to make a choice between quality or productivity, and they'll often rush a call uh, to make their talk time standard, which, which degrades service but also increases the likelihood of a callback. Now, when contact centers have started removing that, what, what they continue to do is have these wall boards in physical contact centers or some, sometimes if we're remote agents, it's, instead of a, a wall board, it's, it's software that's telling me what, mm-hmm. what the queue looks like. And when the queues are read, even if I don't have a, a handle time goal or an email productivity goal or a chat productivity goal, Agents still feel pressure to work faster. They're anticipating that the next customer who is waiting will be agitated. And when we work faster, service gets worse. We don't do a good job listening, which means that the likelihood of someone having to contact us again increases dramatically. Uh, I did this with a contact center, and their average uh, peak queue immediately cut in half when agents stopped looking at wall boards and started just focusing on call control techniques and working on the customer in front of them. Now, there's a counterintuitive piece to this, and, and Bruce, I know you're a data guy. I only have anecdotal evidence from multiple agents who have who've confided in me. They'll say, okay, we worked through the queue. Now everything's green on the wall board, and now they do the opposite. Instead of rushing through the call, they take their time because they feel they need to recover and when everybody starts taking their time, the queue builds back up. Yeah. yeah. No, I, actually, there is some statistical, um, not for everything you said there, but for part of what you said, and that is that we've seen uh, these uh, charts that show how during those parts of the day where there are fewer calls uh, that the talk times get longer. Um, there was an extreme case of that when I was in the Middle East and uh, the United Arab Emirates, and I noticed that in the evenings, these call times were extremely long. And so I asked about them, you know, why was it that people in the evening where it took so much longer? And they said, well, actually what happens is we have older people who are here who know that we're here and who are home lonely. And they call oh. and <laughs> they spend all kinds of time. And it's impolite in our culture to try to cut that off. So we have these very, very long uh, call times. So we, we sort of had to take that into consideration. But, um, yeah, no, I, I would uh, sort of agree with everything you said. I think one place where I might push back just a little bit has, has to do with uh, ignoring uh, talk time or being aware of it. And I think that managers, even in those situations where you don't want to have pressure on your agents, should be aware of it. It's a metric that shouldn't just be thrown away. Uh, you should keep your eye on it and uh, understand where it's going, how it's trending, and then why. Because oftentimes the why can give you an idea of where you're having problems with your technology, where you're having problems with your knowledge management system, where you're having problems with things that, in fact, do impact quality, and uh, you should address those problems. So that's sort of uh, A. And then the B on it is that uh, there are cases in which you can have training on call handling and call closure, which don't reduce the quality or the effectiveness or the results of the call at all, 
but in fact do reduce the amount of time it takes. And if that sort of thing is done, that is to say the tra training and call handling and call closure is done with an eye toward increasing professionalism of your agents, and you in fact uh, communicate it that way. In other words, we're not trying to get you to hurry through the call. We don't want to increase our you know, uh, repeat calls or anything like that. We're trying to increase your professionalism in terms of how you handle the call and how you uh, close the call then that can uh, be something that's worthwhile. Um, there are, we have even seen that there are parts of the country in which uh, the call closure times are considerably different than other parts of the country. Uh, a New Yorker <laughs> wants to give you back the rest of your day as quickly as possible and, um, and, and uh, also wants to have more time for him or herself. In uh, the southern states, particularly when we started doing this back, you know, 20 years ago, uh, those call closure times oftentimes were uh, quite long. And if you can, you know, help the agent to professionalize in terms of call handling and uh, call control and call closure, let me put it that way, uh, that can be a good thing. So, uh, so Bruce, I think we're in complete. Or? No, we're we're in complete agreement that that. The, the, I think the, the piece that we're both trying to clarify is that handle time and queue is information that's vital to a manager to understand what's going on. Do I have the right pl people in the right place at the right time? What, what do I see in terms of outliers? Uh, it's not helpful information for an agent because I want an agent to provide a consistent experience on every contact. And when you talk about call control or call closure, to your point, uh, that's just – good professionalism. So we're not trying to rush through the call. We're just trying to get the customer to the end of the contact uh, in a way that benefits them as quickly as possible uh, without making them feel rushed. So that's focusing on behaviors. And, and so I, I think right. we're in, in complete agreement there. It, it's We want agents to have a consistently professional approach to every call regardless of the queue. Right. I agree. And, and so the one thing is that there may be some managers on the call here who are saying, I've just decided hands off handle time, right? Hands off. And uh, my advice would be, no, you know, keep an eye on handle time because A, that can be a, an indication of places where processes and technology are failing you. And B, uh, may also indicate areas where you can introduce the kind of training that I was talking about that you may not have thought about previously. So, so that would be it. I've got another question for you here. And that, you know, what is one thing contact center leaders could do right now to help agents improve customer service? This is going to sound so obvious, but I assure you it doesn't happen. One thing you can do as soon as you get off this call today, go talk to your agents. And, and here's what I mean by this. I, I had a conversation I uh, just recently with a, an HR professional, and she was talking about a, a tension between you know, a frontline employee and a manager. And, and why was there tension? Because the manager was new, and the manager did what many managers did uh, and, and do consistently, which is create a solution and then announce it to the team without right. understanding the problem. And so the manager says, everybody, here is now, here's the new uh, call script. Here's the new quality monitoring form. Here's the new attendance policy. You know, fill in the blank. And the agent's saying, hey, there's a huge problem with this. This doesn't actually make any sense. If you ask me to do it that way, things will get worse. Mm -hmm. If you talk yep. to your agent yep. first, they, they will tell you, you know, this is the challenge that I'm having. Or, you know, on that last call or that last email, this is the biggest challenge or this is the part that I'm struggling with and if you have that conversation and work with your agents to find solutions rather than just pushing solutions down on your agents you're going to find better solutions you're going to get better buy-in mm -hmm. absolutely no, that, that, that is a, a great advice I think it's true for managers at any level with any uh, subordinates is to do that and in, in those cases where uh, the, there are certain mechanisms. For instance, the huddle board can be a way of actually soliciting, without even asking for it, 
um, great ideas uh, that you may not have even thought about. So instead of imposing your best thoughts on things, listen. Um, uh, you know, you, everybody's heard the expression, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a good reason. <laughs> you should uh, spend some time listening before you do your pro- proclaiming. So, okay, this is and great it will, content. So, uh, it, will, uh, go ahead. it will help you solve problems faster, too, because there's a good chance that one of your agents has already figured out the problem you're trying to solve. You just need to find that person and communicate the solution to everyone else. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So huddle boards, uh, agent committees. Uh, we had one client who um, was having real problems in terms of morale, et cetera. Uh, she set up a committee of agents and uh, really turned things around. And she learned all kinds of things that she didn't know about, uh, as did we. So it was really good. Uh, great. Well, we're uh, getting toward the end of the hour, but we've got time for a few questions, I think. So let me ask Alan to uh, to uh, proceed with those. Yes, we have a couple questions here. Uh, one, The first one is from Roberto, and he's asking, do you find there are bigger obstacles in bigger centers, or are the obstacles all the same regardless of the center size? I would say, Roberto, and to, and to anybody else, regardless of the size of your contact center, uh, the obstacles are different in some cases, and then there's some universal obstacles. So, uh, I'll give you an example that's very common and talk about how it's different but also the same in uh, different contact centers. So in a small contact center, many small contact centers right now have agents respond to emails in between phone calls. And it seems like a good practice because I'm filling that time. I, I, I might have gaps in between calls where you know my agents are just sitting around So asking them to do other work seems like a good idea. What actually happens is agents are in the middle of an email and then the phone rings, so they stop reading the email. It takes them a second or two to be fully present with the customer on the phone, which hurts rapport, which makes that call go longer and worse than it could have been. And then they have to go back and reread the email again, and they're so worried about the next call coming in that they actually take longer to write a response and probably are going to make a mistake, or the likelihood of a mistake goes way up. Now, in a larger contact center, we're more likely to have completely separate queues for phone and for email, chat, you know, other types of channels, so that's not as likely to be a big challenge. If you're in the small contact center, I can tell you, uh, run your own experiment. I've done this many times by having separate queues. And what instantly happens every time I run the experiment is productivity in both queues goes up and quality goes way up. And what you can do is if you have a big spike in phone calls, you can shift some of those email people temporarily to the phones and vice versa. Now, here's the part that's universal regardless of the size, and that is is, is having queues or productivity metrics. Uh, in fact, it might even be a bigger challenge in large contact centers where there's more likely to be uh, a lot of templates, a lot of macros that are driving the writing. And this can cause some, some big problems when people are so focused on the queue and not on the customer. So as an example, uh, I was recently corresponding for technical support with a contact center agent. And, and one of the nice things was I was able to continue the conversation with the same agent. So that was the best practice. However, I can tell the agent was so focused on ripping through each email and getting to the next message that each time I wrote to her, she read about half of what I wrote, responded to that, but missed the other half. Or uh, in one case, she was trying to troubleshoot the problem, and I was explicit about the software I was using, and she misunderstood and and didn't see that that I had written that and, and was using different software to troubleshoot the same issue. So we end up having you know, six emails back and forth that should have been taken care of on the very first message. And, and that's a universal challenge, I think, in all contact centers. They're, we're so focused on the queue and getting to the next message, we don't take that extra beat, and as a result, we have a lot of extra contacts. Right. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to get in uh, more questions here, so I won't add anything to that. That was a great answer. Okay. Uh, Alan, do you want to ask the next question? Yes, we have one from Melissa. And she's asking, if our center is already using rewards programs or gamification, 
How do we get away from agents expecting these things like prize wheels? So I've got some really bad news for Melissa and for everyone else. The research has been really clear on this. Once you introduce a prize, uh, people expect that. And, and I've, I, I've talked to you know, just this week, contact center leaders who said, you know, we, we implemented a prize for survey scores last quarter, and now uh, we've moved away from that, and now the prize is for quality, and suddenly people are really disinterested in survey scores. So that's, that's a big challenge, and, and I don't know of a perfect response uh, for you, Melissa, other than to say we want to slowly back away from gamification and prizes and, and really start focusing more and more on the why behind what we're doing. Um, we, we might have to change rewards, which is if then, if you get a great score on your survey, then you get this prize, to more recognition using the same budget. And recognition is, hey, you didn't expect to see this coming, but you, you got a great call um, uh, just a moment ago, and, and it hit everything on the quality assurance grid and, and the customer was excited so we're going to recognize you with this gift card uh, so it's a mm -hmm. it's a same budget but just a different twist and recognition is shown to be very powerful but I will say uh, if you're trying to back away from that which you should it's unfortunately just going to be a very slow long process to get agents to embrace that new normal okay one thing that I could add here is that and it's too late for you now Melissa but uh, is when you're thinking about doing any of these things uh, think about how you can introduce it as a beta or a pilot program uh, and tell everybody that. So if you're going to, uh, uh, you know, do anything, uh, it's always better to do it as a pilot and to let people know that it's going to be reevaluated after a certain period of time, after three months or six months or uh, so many weeks, whatever it happens to be. Because then uh, it's not you being erratic or a bad manager or whatever. Uh, you're trying something out. And uh, then if you have to back away from it or change it or whatever, that's in the nature of pilots. It's in the nature of betas. So uh, you, you know, cover yourself that way. So whenever you're introducing something new that you're not quite sure that you want, are going to want to stay with or it's not sure if it's going to work the way you wanted it to work, then I really encourage you to, to um, frame that as a pilot program. And, Alan, I think, uh, do you have another one here? Got one more. Uh, we're here getting from to the Vicky. end here, but I, I'd really like to, to, to be able to answer any questions that come in. Yes, I got one more here from Vicki, and she's asking, what is one of the more surprising obstacles you have encountered? Oh, um, that's a good question, Vicki. A lot of times um, I think they're surprising to contact center leaders. Uh, they're they're uh, not always surprising to me because I, I have a, a, a hypothesis about you know why people are doing what they're doing. But but one that came up recently that uh, was surprising in terms of how big an impact it had was time of day. And what I mean is, um, many of you may have heard that we as humans have a circadian rhythm where we have different energy levels throughout the day. Well, uh, I, I was able to get a hold of some data sets from a couple of contact centers and look at customer satisfaction for the same pool of agents by the time of day that we serve the customer. And the afternoon turned out to be a miserable time for customer service, uh, eight <laughs> percentage points lower in terms of customer satisfaction for one contact center. So the the – the surprise of the revelation is that your agents, you might start the day feeling good, but their energy level is going to drain right before the break, right before lunch, and about mid-afternoon if they're on a, a typical day shift, it's going to be at its worst. And, and there are a couple things you can do about that, so that was part of the research too. Uh, one of the things that you can do is encourage your agents to take micro breaks. It could be something as simple as 20 seconds, stand up, stretch just a little bit to get right back to the phones. When they do take uh, a scheduled break, if they uh, do more than just sit around and check social media, but maybe go outside and take a walk, that can be helpful. And if you have the ability to give them some different type of work periodically throughout the day to help them refresh, for example, maybe take them out of the queue for half an hour and have them update a knowledge base article, 
uh, that can help them as well. But uh, run your own experiment in your own contact center. Look at customer satisfaction by time of day, and you might find the same surprising result. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, that's great. Uh, one of the other things that I might suggest, too, is that some people may find it useful to consider part-time agents, uh, particularly for those people who have children, uh, having people who come in from 10 to 3, something like that. Uh, that could work well for you and uh, may avoid the uh, drop in en the energy drop there, the glucose uh, deficit that uh, you're seeing there in the afternoon. Well, great Great uh, episode here. Really, I want to thank uh, Jeff so much for being with us. And uh, do you have any final uh, words of wisdom before we close off and hand things back over to Alan? The only thing I'll say, Bruce, is to echo something I think you said earlier uh, in a different way, which is don't take my word for it. Uh, trust Bruce maybe more than, more than me. He has a lot of data. But you have data in your contact center. Run an experiment. Run a pilot and test out some of the things that, that we shared with you today. And, and that's where your proof is for senior leaders when you can use your own data. So don't take my word for it. Run your own tests and, and see what you find out. Amen. And whenever you feel you can uh, share some of that with us, we, we love data. We love uh, that kind of thing. So that's great. Well, again, thank you so much, Jeff. And with that, we've gone a little bit older over, but I think it's been uh, more than worth it. So we'll hand things back to, uh, to Alan. Thanks again to Jeff and to Bruce for your insightful discussion on today's show. Be sure to join us next month for another great show or look at a huge selection of archive shows and topics at BenchmarkPortal.com. Then click on Call Talk, where you'll find over nine seasons of this show. From all of us at Benchmark Portal, keep your headset steady and your fingers ready. This is Alan Pockfighter signing out. Have a great Halloween. <laughs>